हाय विनय हाय श्रुति हाय भावजन ओके विनय सेंट मी रिक्वेस्ट हाय कविता वेलकम एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग गुड आफ्टरनून गुड मॉर्निंग डिपेंडिंग ऑन विच पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड यू आर लॉग्ड इन फ्रॉम हाय ज्योतिका हाय सुधीर जी हे विनय हाउ आर यू can you hear me vinay i can can you hear me yeah i can i can um yeah, but, okay it is a bit uh, blurred i don't know whether it's my uh, can we just ask some i, I no i think uh, there is a slight issue with my device so oh, that's fine i mean uh, we really so yeah it will it will look it will add to my mysterious aura so very good <laughs> Sure, fantastic. Looking forward to that. Um, so, welcome, Vinay. I, I mean, uh, um, after a series of WhatsApp messages and everything, here we are looking over yes. <laughs> on Instagram. It's almost bizarre, Vinay, that um, you know uh, this book that I'm reading, incidentally, which is sort of not connected with anything that we're going to be discussing. It's on feminism, and it has these beautiful mm-hmm. words that I happen to read today. And it says, "Stories really keep us alive." It says, "Stories." Wow. how to live stories reverberate through our imagination and reimagining you know i want to tell people who are logged in here um, that it is really with an intent to soak in the fantastic quality of stories to really let us travel uh, to give us the wings to fly even we are all in a certain way trapped in our homes um, yeah. to allow us to add layers and meanings to the many goddesses who are part of the hindu pantheon whom we imagine through you know many different lenses and to do it in a sort of collective way where we actually sit down with a group of people feel that energy of a group of people who want to participate in a similar experience right. and even though it may be through the uh, you know filter of a laptop or a mobile screen uh, that we decided to really curate uh, this uh, deep right. immersive storytelling series with vinay varanasi and when i sort of reached out to vinay following a beautiful lecture i heard uh, on kashi um with literally had us travel to varanasi uh, thanks to radhika shetty who curated that uh, i reached out to vinay and he suggested actually we delve into the idea of the goddesses through a six part series that would allow participants an in-depth view of these beautiful manifestations of the supreme shakti uh, goddesses who have distinct identities and personalities of their own who will come alive through vinay's stories and storytelling so we begin this six part series with a session on sita the power of yes. women yeah uh, on june 19th so for those who haven't registered here's my me doing a little marketing those who haven't registered head to the link in alap's um, um you know story and swipe up okay uh, sorry i'm just interrupted i'm just going to take a break because sindhu says vinay do you mind moving somewhere else where we can see you better it's quite hazy but i think it's is it really bad yeah i think it, the issue is not the place it's the the front camera is <laughs> cracked so oh. um i'm going to i'm going to get that fixed though oh. so before the next one we're good don't worry about that okay so for those who don't know please allow me a moment to introduce um vinay to all of you uh, vinay varanasi works at the intersection of different fields sanatana dharma storytelling and art he paints uh tell stories and binds them together his fascination for all things indic led him to conceptualize and execute unique productions with musicians like ramakrishna murthy vivek sadashivam and sumesh narayanan these productions have been about storytelling and music coming together seamlessly uh i also just realized today when i read his bio that he's also a lyricist and has uh, written pallavi lyrics for that have been tuned and sung by famous musicians including ranjini gayatri gayatri venkatraghavan ramakrishna murthy just to name a few his fascination with the art has led him to develop his own unique style of art where he represents the puranic concepts music compositions vedantic ideas through his artwork his journey he says continues to unfold in these directions for the massiveness of the universe constantly overwhelms and amazes him uh when i meet you okay so yeah i think it's like yes, some, i know yeah some stroke of uh, like the universe that we we are here talking and it's Thank so you. bizarre because i don't really sign up for any of these uh, you know sessions because honestly i'm so busy just with work and it just so happened Thank that me that i got this invite from radhika and i said okay hello let me give this a shot and you wow. know one thing led to so a very okay. warm welcome to you and thank you for uh, you know joining hands with alap it really means a lot to us 
thank you firstly for having me i think um, after uh, that talk on kashi i was just so so surprised by the amount of warmth that came in and immediately you reached out and then i think one thing like you said led to the other and it just felt like you know this was meant to happen i would have never imagined uh, myself to give a six series talk on something because i don't feel like i know enough about anything to like manage through six different uh, uh, episodes of something but i think i think it's that joint love for storytelling like you were sharing in the beginning right the idea of what stories can do to us and how they can transport us to a completely different place uh, i think i think that's what we're all craving um, not just for a physically different place but also an emotionally different place uh, from these scary times so i think that's that's what really excites me about the power of why why we're here as such no for sure um you know uh, when i'm going to sort of rewind and my first question really is to ask you what is the first story that you heard um that you remember that had a sort of a lasting impression that made a lasting impression on you that's a very interesting question because um in my head everything is like really jumbled from like before i was like 10 i think it's it's all just one big um story but i remember that um i was probably 8 or something in that in that eight, in that bracket and um, i'd had a dream and I, in my dream i was playing hide and seek and i was playing hide and seek with this i'm i'm i live in bangalore so um at that time uh, camp fort which is this huge uh, the they they had constructed a huge shiva behind um their mall at that time and i was very fascinated by that i'd just gone there and i'd come back and that same night i dreamt that i was playing hide and seek with that shiva from that camp fort and uh, i remember waking up in the morning and i think the first story i recall ever was that i told myself how this game ended and in this game i won and i was one upon him and i said dabba before him or something very silly like that and uh, when i wrote this down i remember that i read it for myself and i said wow this still makes me happy you know a whole day later i read this story two days later i read this story so i kept going back to that story i don't even know why obviously it was completely fictional and just some uh, crazy 8 year old's dream but i think that that had a lasting impact on me because the person who was in the dream outside of me was someone who i was only seeing in a statue and that's what made it very very fascinating yeah. to go back to because then he would he would talk to me in whatever way i wanted to so it was Fantastic. it was almost as if you take out hobbs and you put this kemford shiva there and suddenly i had a whole new friend right so i think that that is probably the first story that i recall at least when you ask that's the first question that first thing that comes to my head almost god right yeah absolutely and yeah. and and i think the idea is that at that time it didn't feel unapproachable or it didn't feel intimidating in that sense that i would think oh i'm i'm you know i can dismiss this as imagination um at that time it felt like why why can't this this kemford shiva be my friend i mean yeah. he is my friend that's fine so i think the comfort level with stories probably began somewhere around there i have no idea and it's also interesting that this was a, a god right i mean a god sort of featured in your story so it was definitely the universe sort of sending out some signal right vinay oh yeah yeah i think the universe sent out all kinds of signals uh, and got me and my entire family confused because uh, i don't know where this obsession comes from but i realized that the, the power of the stories that i read because i used to be obsessed with amar chitrakala as a kid and uh, my obsession was not something that died out i think all of us have that phase when tinkle and amar chitrakala are you know, very very important and we just want to like lap it all up at some point but no matter what i did i just wanted to collect more i wanted to reread the same things and i didn't realize they're getting internalized it's only now years later that i'm realizing when i actually read the original stories i realize oh my goodness somewhere this seems familiar i think it's because that bond with those characters started and when that starts i think then it it transcends this idea of human and god it just becomes yeah. a character no. someone that i'm is is close to me exactly and it's also amazing how stories that we read that have a sort of impact on us somewhere remain in our subconscious right and they sort of Definitely. recurring or uh, you know keep uh, like something i mean we're constantly reminded of them in some way right yeah definitely definitely um when i want to ask you next um so in some sense at what point did you decide that you wanted to be or become a storyteller I actually don't know to be honest because I'm uh 
it's happened very accidentally it's just that i've been really lucky because i've always been surrounded by um friends and people my people yeah. who have just sparked up really interesting conversations so from conversations i think i would come back feeling very invigorated you know that kind of feeling when when you leave very enriched after a conversation because sure. it would never be a one way thing i would either be listening and sharing and i think at some point i just felt like there's just too much sitting in my head for me to to sit with it alone right. so it started to come up very gently it found expression in some places it found expression to be honest first in art before it did right. in storytelling um i think when i when i was with the paper and the canvas or whatever that's when i realized that um something is coming that's not that has nothing to do with me it's just coming through me and that was exciting for me because when that happened i realized i didn't have to be in charge i don't have to figure out what the right thing to say is or or i i never thought about it it just came on the paper a lot of times so i think right. that eventually gave me that confidence that whatever story i'm trying to tell through this art i can also do it through words as long as i know what i'm talking about as long as i'm comfortable with it which is right. exactly why even when we were um, you know picking stories for example for the six series that we're going to do when we're picking different goddesses one mm-hmm. of the things i was really particular about was let me there are so many goddesses and i was really spoiled for choice wondering what should, who should i talk about but then i said when let's not get carried away by the enthusiasm let's make sure we talk about something that we know at least 1% of so i think um for me stories have always been about authenticity if i relate to something if i've internalized it i can talk about it so maybe at that point when i started realizing that it was getting internalized maybe that's that's probably when i started um believing right. in the in the power of uh, storytelling myself right uh, binay there's one word that you used uh, which was uh, you didn't want to sit alone with your uh, story right so uh, this act of storytelling itself is sort of a uh, it's a sort of a it's a shared experience right i mean it sort of comes alive when it's a participative experience right oh yeah yeah totally and um, i think that's what's been really fun to explore so one aspect of it is you know when i'm sitting and i'm sharing something and people are responding people are absorbing it but for me what has really pushed the power of storytelling and i have to narrate this is because it it was one of the most um, moving things that happened was um, sumesh and i got a chance about a year and a half ago just before the pandemic uh, we both performed at a lovely place called uh, the living room kacheri which is owned by gurupriya atreya and uh, you must be knowing about the living room kacheri so uh, sumesh and i i had actually we have been working on another project for quite some time and we thought you know what let's let's perform at the living room kacheri to also get an idea of how do we work as a team how do we set our own rapo so That's we decided we were going to uh, we were performing one day after shivratri if i'm yeah and uh, so we said you know what let's have a an just an evening of percussion and storytelling see when i'm when i'm doing these things with let's say musicians with vocalists i have lyrics right they have they're singing lyrics so it's very easy to to weave that into a narration and you know i'm talking about something and they can sing about that something but what right. do you do with percussion so then sumesh and i sat together and we chose some stories uh, of shiva that had a very strong percussion element in it a strong aspect of laya and uh, we put them together and we were very confident that um, we would be able to put these three stories together for one and a half hours hmm. except that we finished in 35 minutes all the three stories oh. and the audience was just looking at us like okay where's more and uh, so sumesh and i realized okay we cannot walk out now i mean people are here for a one and a half hour show and not even half of it is up oh, so at that point i think we just improvised and we he said you know what let's just go for it and we i picked stories that i knew and sumesh brought in his strong sense of laya and we just let it flow and i think that's when i realized because i was watching the faces of the people around people were much more moved by the stories that we did impromptu than the ones that we had even planned for saying okay in this point i'm going to give it to you this point you're going to give it to me i think we had nothing rehearsed and i think that's when i realized that when stories come from the heart they speak to the heart they don't speak to the intellect anymore so yeah i think that's that's why storytelling still remains a very strong part of my my journey when it's shared that that energy is yeah it's it's income yeah and it's beautiful that you use the word authentic right i mean that's right yeah yeah, yeah. um you know uh, uh, when i want to ask you as a painter you're also always imagining stories visually right and you also mentioned that sometimes it's the visual that comes to you first 
and then it sort of um, uh, segues into words so i want to ask you uh, you know how does that visual imagery really um enhance or enrich the way you envisage a story uh truth be told i think um i remember watching this in a ted talk somewhere um, i'm not sure i think it is the author of eat pray and love uh when she she had oh, yeah. spoken about how yeah when she had spoken about how when inspiration strikes she had to just like stop everything she was doing and record it at right. that point yeah i i made the mistake of watching this ted talk really early on so i also used to keep think thinking that you know inspiration is just going to fall and i'm going to have to like stop everything i'm doing and right yeah. except that that never happened like right? never so most of the times what happens in my head is that an idea comes and it's just stuck there it it won't go it's constantly processing and when i least expect it it finds an output so suddenly i could be looking at something unrelated and suddenly i realize hey this color combination works so i think that started happening a lot with my art when i took um, certain ideas and said so for example this morning on instagram i put something that i was uh, trying to sit with yeah this is the idea of in in the ramayana we have this one segment where uh, rama is feeling a little tired as per the narration and he's unable to defeat ravana so he's mentally he's not in a great place yeah. and at that moment agastya comes and he gives him the aditya hridaya i want to put this out in art there are people who have done this before it is cover art for a lot of uh, books a lot of things but i was just i never felt like i could relate to it so i said okay let's let's try and find expression i have spent over 2 months on this idea and nothing has come out but through the process i've realized that as a as a visual artist unless i'm convinced of something it doesn't even leave my body it won't even leave the paper i can't even draw lines if i'm not feeling like okay i know this concept has has some solidarity inside me so i guess that's how it it rolls out for me wow interesting um you know uh, when i i think like uh, the beauty of a story is that we all also in a certain way are our own storytellers right uh yeah, yeah. i form visuals of stories in our own heads right like I, yeah. for example like i uh, Uh, if there is a film that's been adapted from a book i always just read the book first because i want to first get the visual in my head and then say what does it match up to this amazing visual that yeah. i have in my head um and but storytellers storytellers are also who they are because of the way they tell a story and because how they sort of really bring that story alive i want to ask you vinay what is your according to you your unique um you know act or aesthetic of storytelling and how do you delve a, into a story and how do you recognize that okay this is a story that uh, that you want to tell that you want to retell that is a really really tough question uh because i think you'll 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 also see this about me as we go on with the six series that i i never feel like i do anything i never feel like okay it's I, i'm telling a story i just feel like sometimes it's just coming through me and i just have to stay quiet and let it come um but having said that at least from my circle of people and people whose whose support and criticism has has kind of pushed me to do to do what i do the one thing i think that um i i believe in doing is creating that that narrative or that visual for people so it's um i think it 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 has to do with the fact that if i can be transported when i'm saying it someone can be transported when they're hearing it. it it's not difficult it's just uh i think one of the things that helped in this was in school we do like a lot of these debates and we would you know and they have these standard formats right one person is for and one person is against and then you have to go into this stupid vehement mode where you say oh do i need to pay my tax pay money so people go to nasa and this becomes a debate right yeah, yeah. but one of the useful things the only useful thing i picked up from these school debates was voice modulation so when you're trying to stress on something really important yeah. you you uh, change your tone accordingly and it's not that this was ever told to us but it's just how you absorb it right a uh, most powerful debaters would be would be powerful because of their voice and the command yeah. over the voice with the modulation so exactly right so that modulation matters and i think that's something when when you tie that up with the power of the stories that the indian pantheon has yeah if that recreates a whole different experience for people 
Uh, as opposed to being monotone about the whole thing, it just it just takes people into a different zone. So I think um, that's probably something I do. I'm still struggling to say that I do that, but because you're asking and I have to answer no. it, that would be. No, best. I think so. I mean, one thing that I must say is that in the Kashi lecture, like definitely, like uh, your ability to kind of, um, and I think that also got to do with the fact that you're an artist. That I found the entire experience very, um, like it was a sensory experience. The entire experience for me right. was, I could s smell and like uh, see wow. and listen to the sounds of, uh, you know, the the arti and everything that you said was sort of a sensory experience for me. So I, you know, I'm uh, I agree that you know that uh, the way you've defined your act of storytelling is exactly how we've experienced it. So, wow. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about Sanatana Dharma. You know, one in in a sort of I know it's it's a big topic, but I just want to ask you a little bit about how that actually translates into the way we live our lives. Wow, um, I think I, I think the the word Sanatana Dharma is very beautiful because it um, it has a different different energy to it. Uh, unlike, for example, the word even Hinduism, which has a certain yeah. uh, ism attached to it and all of that, it becomes a different different discussion by itself. Sanatana Dharma doesn't demand saving. It doesn't need uh, it doesn't need anything. It's complete in itself and it's eternal. So one of the the most beautiful aspects for me that I relate to is that I belong to the system and I don't have to worry about oh my goodness, is the system getting corrupted or is there is there no value for the system as long as I'm authentic in the system and I do what I relate to and what I'm able to do with my all. I think that's what, and that, I, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm articulating this now at whatever, at, you know, so many, so many years later, but if in effect, we're all at some level, just living like this, right? Like if we look one or two generations back, if, um, even our grandparents' generation, I feel like this, the idea of living in proximity to nature, the idea of looking at everybody as an aspect of divinity, looking at, I mean, that is, these are just very small components of Sanatana Dharma, which is a huge umbrella. But people live these effortlessly without using big words or without, without having, you know, heavy intellectual discussions about it. So a lot of times I feel like it's ingrained in us and we don't have to try. I think we're all, we all, breathe Sanatana Dharma without even realizing it. And that's what makes it beautiful. The second we realize it, we're very conscious of it and it becomes, oh, yeah. I'm doing this. So I'm therefore a good or a bad practitioner. No, I think we're all just, we're, we're breathing it. We're, that, that's why I wonder sometimes, am I a practitioner or am I just a part of Sanatana Dharma? I, I never know myself. So uh, it's always interesting. No, it's beautiful. I mean, like I said, it's a huge topic and a topic by itself, right? So we will sort of park it for now. And we will sort of dive into what is your fascination with the goddesses? Uh, Vinay, I'm curious, why did you suggest that uh, theme? I mean, I was also, I'm also like, I'm pretty fascinated with the idea of the goddesses. And, but my reasons are very, very different. Um, but I'm curious to hear what is your fascination as a storyteller with the goddesses? So I think my fascination particularly is uh, with the idea that the goddesses are the most misinterpreted. And this has to do with largely overtly patriarchal retellings of their stories. And it has to do with the fact that those who are doing it superimpose several layers. So it one is absorbed patriarchy that they may, be, may have been carrying on. Second is the projection that completely alters the future generation's understanding of a particular goddess. And I think that's, that's why that decision to even move, talk about goddesses that have, have all kinds of um, let's say literature available on them. For example, right? One of the uh, these series that we're going to be doing one is about Kali. Mm. Kali has so much depth to her, but what is the the modern interpretation of Kali that there is just some bloodthirsty goddess and then you know she's just walking around with skulls and yeah, that's some tantric stuff. Not not my department. This yeah. is the first notion that we have of Kali. So I think that that the the idea of you know why why don't we talk about goddesses comes from that idea that why don't we just take a we're all most familiar with the goddess. This is the interesting thing. If if I picked something, you know, a little bit more um, abstract or a little bit more difficult uh, for uh, people, there's no relatability. But the goddess has the most fundamental aspect that everybody relates to her. There is that idea of the maternal aspect. There is the idea of the fierce, the protective, so many different shades to the goddess. And each has their own, whichever part of the country we look at, there is some strong goddess connection there. 
it's not to say that uh, there aren't you know other places where um, or there aren't other deities that are prayed to but i think because we relate to the goddess but we also misinterpret the goddess that's what what matters as to how do we um, you know how do we change the 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 perspective with which we look at her i would say so i think that's that's why i wanted to start that lovely um you know um when i'm curious about in the context of now right why do goddesses really need to be celebrated and why do their stories really need to be uh, retold especially in the current context you know like you use the word like patriarchy and and everything that's happening right um do you think it's imperative that these stories must be told so that we uncover these sort of stereotypes and i think that's what you also mentioned right that we really sort of look at them and um, uh, sort of um, uncover all those uh, in ways in which we have just constantly looked at them right i think uh, the at a time like this when we are especially in the middle of a pandemic when all of us are struggling to find our own coping mechanisms and mm-hmm. our own sources of strength fundamentally the goddess translates the the name that is given to her is shakti and that is energy right there is just so much of energy that that we can tap into that we have access to because this is fundamentally a maternal energy a protective maternal energy that is looking out for us but we don't look at someone like sita as a maternal protective energy we just look at her as some uh, you know forlorn sad consort of rama who is an abalastri who is just was thrown into ravana's ashoka vana and then she sat there mopping when you when we when we downgrade a character like that into this horrible little box right. we lose that connect we yeah. lose the power of what is what is sita really and how do i connect to sita it's not about what happens in the story the question is how is this relevant to me in my journey how do i take sita with me when i walk out tomorrow right. morning of the door right and i think that's that connection today is important because the goddess is not for one group of people or just one particular group with one intellect you know she's for everybody and that changes that that changes only when we are willing to see beyond our um what what is this whatever the word is right that horse eye vision like that, that horse vision yeah exactly and that's been around for generations right like in in retellings of stories in uh, visual depictions of stories if i googled the word sita right now i am not likely to find a picture of a goddess standing confidently by rama's side the yeah. depiction has gradually moved into you can see the body language where she, it's just tame and it's very mellow yeah and when you do things like this it it has a subconscious impact on us right why is it that we look at durga as power and we don't look at sita as power why is it that we don't look at radha as an as an epitome of strength you know why these things are only because stories have not been told to us in the most authentic fashion so no. I, i think that needs to change you know it's so bizarre ravina that this book that i'm reading on feminism actually the author talks about Uh, how actually sita really raised a feminist son she's raised love and kush as really like um, you know as ordinary human beings who didn't like crave for uh, you know a royal life and they were just perfectly happy and they knew that you know dashratha was their grandfather and they knew that sita was their mother and they didn't need feel the need to know that their father was a king so if you look at it like that then it's just like it's an altogether different perspective of she comes across really feminist woman right like a single absolutely ch- children like absolutely in a time like that in right a, like exactly yeah. and one of the things that our generation i feel like we we tend to do this subconsciously without realizing is did we superimpose whatever constraints we have now or whatever we look at as ideas of equality or lack thereof and then apply it to that time not realizing that we're talking about different time time periods and we're also talking about different levels of existence Absolutely. we're not just taking the stories of six powerful women these are goddesses who came as women right, right. so as it is there is just so much to tell from the aspect of the goddess then there is the idea of a woman and how is a woman looking at this particular situation so there's so much to tell there's so much to share and there's so much to change the way we look at it and i i love this perspective that you brought up right that she brought up two fantastically feminist kids um, right. who didn't crave who didn't crave for that royalty at all absolutely uh, and and this is a not this is not the part of the story that we're told in fact our judgment quickly goes to oh but why did this happen to sita why did that happen to sita the- when we're not seeing sita as a character we're seeing uh-huh. her as somebody who is subjected to different episodes in the ramayana that's it correct if we stop there then sita also stops there so i think the idea is to push beyond that and say 
if i can really if this story was truly meant to be immortal then i will have something to relate to this today as of now and i think that's possible if me as a 20 something year old can can take from this then i'm sure there is something for this in every, for everyone no for sure then i'm going to take a little break from asking questions because there are a bunch of questions from uh, the audience we'll take a couple and then i'll go back to my questions all right sure yeah so there is a question from um, uh heart in arts yeah what kind of yeah kausal yes for such storytelling sessions because it just flows like music when you narrate it so i think like what is the kind of research that goes into you know how do you kind of prepare for these sessions so i think um, kausal ji that's a really nice question because i've never known myself to um think of something and then prepare so i i wouldn't suggest a topic and then work backwards and say okay i'm going to talk about this now so i have to research because then it won't be internal for me my yeah. only uh, like i mentioned earlier my only thing is that i need to be authentic so if something is already there i'll talk about it so yeah. uh, that's why i should tell everyone here that i think i i changed the names of the goddesses 10 times with akila before i finally picked on the six because i said no you know what i don't think i know enough about this no i'm not sure i know so much then i had to sit down with myself and say vinay i think there is something that i feel confident enough to share about these six forms so let's go ahead with this so most of the time the preparation is um it's not specific to one particular um you know session mm-hmm. a lot of the times it's it's constantly happening in the background and right. having said that i must i do want to clarify that i make sure that whatever i'm quoting from wherever i'm referring things that is authentic so it's not uh, it's not that this was revealed to me in a dream kind of a thing i make sure that my facts and my sources are authentic at all points so i hope that answers no, that question yeah that's a great response uh, vinay vinay priya rangadathan says is it from internalizing what you read that gives you a strong perspective um uh, i would say yes in part but i also think feeling things is necessary um internalizing things retains it in the head which is great mm-hmm. because then it becomes um yeah. a response of memory but a lot of the times unless i'm feeling moved myself mm-hmm. i can't i can't communicate that idea of how it is to be moved i remember the first time i had um read and i had heard a discourse about sita i was in i remember when i had heard this i was traveling and um, i was in uh, transit and I, this is plugged into my ears and i had to stop for 2 minutes in the middle of an airport to just let myself cry because that moment was so moving when which i'm i'm not going to share that moment here for those of those of you who want to know what that moment is come on saturday uh, but the moment was was so powerful that i had to stop and there were a whole bunch of people walking in and out of an airport terminal and i had to just stop and let that moment take over and that's not the, that's not memory that's not intellect that's not the mind yeah. that's the heart taking in something so i think a lot of the times it's the internalization is coming from here and not from here that's what i drive for and that's what i strive for absolutely response right like how do we respond to something yeah how do we respond yeah uh, when have there been uh, occasions where you heard a story that just didn't in some sense feel right okay and mm-hmm. that you felt that you wanted to actually take it and uh, reimagine it re um, you know retell it like in a way that did justice to you know have have there been stories like that that just didn't like like sometimes you listen to a story and you just don't you just don't that story just doesn't work for you because absolutely absolutely you know? yeah several times uh, especially because um, a lot of the times i read these things in print so when i've read about characters like kali and radha um and i've seen the way stories of these these forms are told in textbooks you know right. uh, whether it's in and uh, or in in novels for right. grown adult reading and then i felt like gosh this is it's not a question of just an error it's not about saying factually this is wrong something else has happened he's misquoting no it's about saying why is this person reducing this character like this and i think that's what irritates me that people can get away with things and not 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 um not be authentic i think it comes back to to me for that it's about not willing to say that you know what there is more to this character that i know and a lot of times i think people are not willing to say that i see that in a lot of modern retellings i see that in a lot of uh, authoritative uh, takes on things that people just say this is the final interpretation 
but i don't think these characters are meant for one angle i don't think uh, it's fair to box them like that so i think a lot of times i have felt like you know what i i would like to go into what this really stands for and i think that's why sita was the first uh, choice for this discussion because most of the readings that i've read about sita are extremely extremely negative and extremely regressive mm. and i have a huge problem with that so i felt like you know what i want to i, I don't want to just combat this for the sake of combating it but i actually want to bring out a perspective that has moved me and i want to share that perspective so yeah yeah i mean it's interesting you use this word i mean i i actually like like really started engaging with this word reductionizing right like we just like reduce like character right. like like one image right when they yeah. have like storehouse of so many images right and we kind of just, like like confine them to like one imagery and that's absolutely yeah yeah that's such a beautiful word right because i think when we do that we we equate them with us so if you know if i'm i am in a, operating from a negative space then i will only see the the flaws in a certain character and i will also superimpose flaws on that character even if there aren't any and that's it i've reduced that character to just those flaws correct uh, and then I, i can't see beyond that right it's it's my blind spot i've hit a blind spot so i think the idea is how do i um how do i not do that how is it that and and this is when it's not about vinay being a storyteller or someone else lip being a story listener it's just about each one of us yeah how do i not reduce a character to to just what i want them to be yeah how can they be that vishwarupam how can i break forth from my my uh, box and see them for what they are i mean it's also interesting when i did the opening of this conversation i read about how stories tell us how to live right and in many ways i think we do this even to the people that we know right not just to like uh, characters from uh, you know mythology or history or whatever we also uh, so i think i suppose that the idea of like listening to stories like these is also to see how we can also open i suppose our minds right and not absolutely um, have these blind spots by way in which we sort of say okay she's a working woman or she's a homemaker we just kind of reduce people to these um you know stereotypes right so very true very very true and i think um i think where things shift is when we start relating to stories that's the one thing that stories have for us is that it's not about did i leave this uh talk feeling like i know more about sita yeah. or you know i can correct somebody if they say everything wrong no um it's just that when i leave this how do i feel as a human being yeah what is shifting in my gaze yeah. that is also tying to your previous question about sanatana dharma where But, how do i feel that spirituality floating all around me you know we again because of because of the way we we have even you know misnomer of spirituality so to speak we start to feel like you know this is just spirituality means that at every given point i need to always be zen and i always need to be you know just looking at the world in great calm but nothing is further from the truth right yeah. it's about saying how what do i draw from those stories which is relevant to me today in this moment no I'm... um and, and i think stories can come to our rescue when we least expect them. yeah they're... when we really have no idea right that they'll come go and bury yourself in it and sort of like suspension of disbelief so to speak right sometimes yeah yes and yes suspension of disbelief absolutely yeah beautifully said uh, uh when i also uh, asha sampat wants to know what appeals most to you in the art of storytelling the um i think storytelling is a kind of facilitation i would say mm -hmm. uh because in storytelling uh, at least according to me the storyteller is not taking on the role of a uh, of an or for no at all mm -hmm. i think the storyteller is just being a medium and that's exactly what a facilitator does right a facilitator is facilitating an experience and the experience remains different for 10 people who may be attending that session so there are 10 different experiences happening right and i think the storyteller's greatest capacity is to allow all those 10 things to happen without being without bulldozing into any one of those spaces so i've seen this in some of the sessions uh, in a pre pandemic world when we would do things live uh, i i saw how sometimes when i told certain stories some eyes were tearing up i would see i i saw this i remember this particular show where someone was tearing up about something that i said and the person sitting next to her was writing down notes very very obsessively now uh, right like so as a as a storyteller my job is to make sure that both those people have their complete experiences 
the person who is tearing up needs to soak that emotion in and let it out. The person who's taking notes is equally valid. If I if I superimpose Vinay on this and say, but why is she taking notes? She just needs to internalize. That's not that's not right. That's not fair. That's not fair for me to say. Mm. So I think that the job of a storyteller is to let each person experience it the way they want to experience it, and not force them to say this is the way of internalizing. Everyone has their own engagement with these things. So yet Vinay, and yet I think that it is a singular expense. Ex- experience of a collective experience right yeah yeah that is true it is a singular experience yeah. very true undeniable so it's like listening and and i mean it, we may respond to it differently but still the whole idea of sharing that space with other people also has its own like energy right it does it does and i think that's what's so beautiful about storytelling because yeah. everybody is collectively transported right you know it's just like traveling to to a place where all collectively transported where we're each experiencing it differently but that safety and that security that someone else is also experiencing yeah. this with me. yeah that's beautiful i think that's what uh, maybe that's the answer to the first question that you asked as well that is what what made me go into more, more and more of storytelling where there are more people involved because i've probably done this one on one for my friends and my people for some time right but i think the idea of taking a group of people and then you know recreating an experience for people and seeing it happen as a as a collective that's a very invigorating experience i uh, so it's it, it it has a different feeling yeah yeah um vinesh of baidi he wants to know um, how do you research and break down this wall of misconception of characters since so much information about these concepts have changed over the years or is lost for the common people and how do you really go about verifying the information that you get so i think um we're in such a lucky time and space where the authentic original books from where things have come for example um to to complete that sentence the authentic original books where things have come are available for us at the click of a button right. so if i had to talk about sita it would be obscure and ridiculous for me to talk about sita without referring to what valmiki ramayana says correct i can have a thousand modern day interpretations about things right but unless i'm looking back at the original source i have no authority to speak on this right. so i think the the foremost research needs to come from saying that i am looking back at my roots and i think that's the essence of also sanatan dharma saying i'm not adding anything new and saying oh i'll tell you the story of sita in such an interesting way that you'll listen no the story of sita is interesting fundamentally yeah. you listen any anyway. anyways i have i have to believe in it so i think the idea is one being authentic and two believing in it myself before i'm sharing it i need to be convinced or i need to feel like i said that that inside of me that yes i i can connect to this character right now and therefore i'm going to be sharing about this particular form so that i hope answers yeah. that question I mean, you're also a re-articulator, right? So you need to do it with clarity and conviction, right? So yes, yeah. conviction and also acknowledge. I think also power of acknowledgement that there may be things that I don't yet understand, and I will come to that. I will get to that. But I, I one of the things I don't relate to in storytelling, which a lot of people do, is I don't like to quickly cover up something and say, yeah, yeah. So this happened because this person did this, and yeah, you know, this justifies this. Yeah, it doesn't sit with. I need to be convinced about it. So if I don't know something, I don't talk about it. It's as simple as that. Right. So, have you had experiences, Vinay, that during a storytelling session, someone else has added another perspective and another layer, and that has further sort of enriched your story? Has that happened? Yes. Yes. As recent as the last talk that I gave, uh, where someone was asking a question about Ganga, mm-hmm. and I was so. Um, i was so keen or i was so persistent on on you know making making this point that ganga has so the question was about why is it that ganga is uh, shiva's wife and, and so in many uh, versions ganga is considered shiva's wife but why is it that even though she is shiva's wife in the mahabharata she goes and marries shantanu you know so yeah. does she have two husbands it was a very interesting question and i was obsessed about uh, you know focusing on the fact that ganga has two parts to her one is eternally wedded to shiva and she's always sitting on his head yeah. and also philosophically it has a lot of different meanings of why she's on his head and then there is this leela aspect of when ganga needs to take form etc and why that's good for the world and i kept focusing on that and it, i wasn't i wasn't thinking beyond that and someone else said can i add on to that and i said sure and someone said that's also because ganga had to uh, relieve the curse that you know the eight the, she drowns eight children right when shantanu has 
that was the condition on which they get married so those are the the eight vasus uh, we have the ashta vasu devatas that had a curse from indra that they would be born on earth and therefore they would and then they would die and leave their body and she had to come to fulfill that that thing okay. i i probably known this it's somewhere been at the back of my head but i didn't ever realize it so when someone else adds on and um i think for me what it does is it it really makes me feel like people are listening it really makes me feel like you know what this is a shared experience now i'm being facilitated someone else just took me into the zone right so it's not just me and that's the best part of it when people are so involved that it's a conversation yeah absolutely so there is like a real question here um, from kavita pai she says uh, is is the session op- op- open for pre teens what do you think when pre teens it's an interesting question <laughs> i i strongly believe in one thing that um stories are like seeds if they get into us um through these apertures of our years whether they germinate now whether they germinate later just depends on the environment around us so whether it is pre teens whether it is post teens it at some level whether they're understanding or not i feel like just hearing these things matters um having said that i do believe that like there is as we progress in the stories that we're talking about and when we move into philosophy there is some amount of maturity that is required definitely but having said that i think samskara or just having that that ability to say that i listen even if i don't understand a thing sometimes i listen to lectures on vedanta where i understand zilch but my idea is let it get in you know i don't know when this thing is going to germinate it's like composting right i when i compost i put a whole lot of things in my compost i have no idea what seeds are coming and things germinate by themselves later so when the environment is right things will take form so i think that people are free to attend it as long as they have the respect enough to say that just because i don't understand it from my uh, perspective doesn't mean that it's not good or it's not um, it's it's hazy so yeah okay great so kavita we're looking forward to seeing your um, daughter uh, yes. question now uh, when how do you balance the pressure of explaining puranic stories based on today's legal and societal norms with the fear that they may otherwise be misjudged that's a lovely question um i think one of the things that i realized really early on um was that if i try to be politically correct or if i try to be politically incorrect yeah. i'm still taking a stance i'm not doing justice to what i'm trying to talk about but if i stick to what i'm trying to say things of social relevance thing concepts of gender equality these will get addressed by the power of what i'm talking about and if they don't get addressed then words will come in order for me to to actually talk about them but one thing that i always want to be i want to consciously work on even as a storyteller is not to get so carried away that i quickly convince people saying yeah yeah so you can see there is some gender equality happening here no if i'm saying that i want to feel like no i need to know this myself yeah. and if i don't feel it i'm not going to say it but at the same time i also trust um i trust the the sources that i look at or i trust i trust the power of sanatana dharma above everything else that it is beyond gender politics it is beyond uh, you know environmental degradation it is not here in order to differentiate us into different communities or into different um sects of society i think it's it's greater than that these are all components that have been misinterpreted have been uh, abused in many senses but fundamentally at its purest i believe in it so i think me going back to that that belief helps me look beyond these lenses and also address these because these are relevant i can't i can't just say i don't want to talk about this because you know this didn't exist at that time that's not true we need to feel convinced about it if we're going to be hearing about it if we want to internalize it so i think those things do get addressed when we believe in the power of authenticity lovely um this question from tania saxena she says um interesting perspective about looking at oneself as a facilitator do you think one can extrapolate to say that all art is a facilitation of experience all art is a facilitation of experience wow i think when that's said in those words um yeah all art is essentially a facilitation of experience but the difference is that what is the quality of that experience really matters um in the sense that when we look at art as and we reduce it to just an experience mm. then an experience has a start and it has a finish um but with art what changes 
is its innate power to to stay beyond the length of that experience right you know if if i can for example let's we we uh, connected in, in when we were talking about kashi right now we can talk about kashi we can be transported to kashi for those 45 minutes for the, that brief time but what happens after i leave that zoom call do i still want to go to kashi do i still feel it 10 days later i may not be constantly thinking about it but did kashi enter my mind yeah then it's not an experience then it's something else and i don't know what the word for that for that something else is but then it, it it's retained um so it's not it's not escape so i think that that is the power of art that is the power of storytelling that's the power of music yeah uh dance any 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 art form what we call art is just it's opening a door of a different dimension inside us that we did not know existed because that door is always open and we always have access to it okay. so but the, but this but this storytelling series is not just for artists right and it's open to anybody no, no. In, and it is curious to yeah yes i i particularly want to talk about that because i feel that um so this is one of the other things that's gone wrong with with uh, puranic uh, story retelling especially is that we have started to intel- intellectualize this we have started to make this accessible to an elite group of people who if you know this then you yeah. come here if you don't know this then you know what you may not take so no that's not true these stories were not written for one or two people or one group of people these stories were practically meant for everybody and i think uh, that's exactly what i wanted to invite and you know really uh, put it out there that you could be practically from any field of life you don't have to be associated to a traditional art form you don't need to have music or dance running in your blood i don't have either of those things running in my blood but uh, it has nothing to do with that the point is that we're here to go on a journey and that journey just means we shared whatever we know and we say we're going to walk into this experience and we're going to let this experience dictate something for us so you could be from any background and that's it's only when we we are willing to see it like that will we actually go if we enter if i enter saying i am a storyteller my job starts and finishes here i don't think i'll be able to do much either so it is meant for practically everybody and i can assure you of that Uh, and hopefully you will assure me back of that once the first session is over yeah, absolutely uh, when i just want to ask you one question before we let you go is um, you know what is your uh, daily rigor like you know uh, being on your own i asked i did a panel discussion yesterday with a whole bunch of young indian i saw that yeah i saw that and um, you know i asked them really about how it how hard it must be for a um, you know somebody who works on their own and creatively oriented to sort of really um, you know and that too for you you kind of like do these different things of course they intersect but still sort of to do you have like a daily routine rigor and is that rigor really important i that's a that's a very i i like the last part of the question of is that rigor important <laughs> i think one of the um when i had gone for my masters um one of my closest friends the only thing she said to me was um don't underestimate the power of routine and i said what do you mean and she said you're going to a new place you're going with to a place that has very little in 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 um connection to you yeah if you set for yourself a routine in that routine you will find magic and i think i didn't realize the power of that um until i actually set that up and i realized that a routine not only gives familiarity and discipline it also gives structure it gives space and time for the mind or for the heart to actually engage with something so i have parts of a daily routine that are very sacrosanct for me i will not compromise on them um and for me it's not about uh, so even answering the previous questions of how do i prepare i'm not consciously thinking 2 minutes or 1 hour before a talk as to okay i will say this sentence in this way but when i'm uh, out on my runs uh, or when i'm working out suddenly something will come saying oh you know what i i think that that should be relevant we should talk about that so i think routine um it's not it's not you know like train compartments where different things are just clubbed together i think one thing feeds another so in my daily routine there is there is space for a workout and i know that that is important because my mind gets cleared up at that time um there is space for meditation which more often than not tells me that i have a long way to go in terms of being able to actually meditate um there is space for art and there are days when these things don't happen but one of the things i've learned from artists that i follow um and not just on instagram but actually yeah. in real life is that uh there are there are times of phenomenal activity and there are times of phenomenal inactivity and both are okay 
yeah. but showing up is important. Just showing up. Even if I'm, I'm not going to perform today, if I'm not able to, it's fine. But I have to just show up. So I think that for me is rigor. That I just show up every day, even if it's with a sullen face and, you know, I get two strokes across on the page. That's okay. But I'm here and I promise to be here and I'm, I'm here. So, I'm yeah. The rigor in our life right now, Vinay, is that we're going to be doing a six-part series with you. So we're going to be meeting you every month. And that's a rigor that we are yes. genuinely, really looking forward to. Uh, Absolutely, um, likewise. <laughs> so there's somebody who said something really nice. And I want to kind of um, uh, wind, uh, sort of wrap this with this. I think Tantri the Mantri said, did the universe somehow crack your camera as a metaphor to crack perspectives of goddesses that unfortunately today? Thank you for helping mend those cracks and for fixing your camera. I thought that was really, uh, so uh, really so sweet. Yeah, that was my camera acting up. Sorry. <laughs> See, universe is universe is really saying something to both of us. But yeah, I mean, I thank you so much, and thank you to every single person who joined this conversation and truly made it a shared collective experience. I had many more questions. But I think people ask such beautiful questions that I sort of have parked mine aside. Um, we're really looking forward to the six part series. So those of you here who haven't registered for it, please do so. We begin on Saturday and we begin with Sita. And we're really looking forward to the many dimensions that, um, um, that Vinay is going to uh, cover and uncover for us. So thank you so much, Vinay. And thank you to everybody who watched. And stay safe, everyone. The pandemic isn't over yet. Uh, so please yes. take care of yourselves and thank you Vinay. Thank you so much Akhla. It's, it, I, I mean just getting into this rigor now is, is getting me excited for Saturday. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing and also hearing from people. I think that's that's uh, one of the things that I absolutely love is when, when I see video faces. I can't believe that I would ever say this because I always thought I'll see people in person. But even seeing people on a video, just people showing up, right? Even now there are some 75 odd people here. Yeah. Thank you for, you know, just showing us that you guys are showing up to 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 what we are trying to put together. So that's that's enough encouragement. And I'm hoping to see this group and more on I can't Saturday. More. I mean, truly like, you know, like uh, I say this over and over again, when I literally like this pandemic, like there are some people who've come and just stayed during an Instagram live session. And that just that sheer support, right, has really gone a long way, right? And Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you and uh, see you all soon. You. And take care, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye.